that Old Testament God creates a gate at the east of Eden, places cherubim on either side of the gate and a flaming sword in the center, and says, uh, don't come back. So ever since then, we've been seeking that gate that returns us to the paradisical realm. And, but the one thing that most people forget is that not only did God create that gate, but the book of Genesis also says that when Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden, God at that moment then made coats of skin for them as well. So if we didn't have coats of skin when we were in the Garden of Eden, what form exactly were we in when we were in the Garden of Eden? In my view, and this is based on Judeo-Christian uh, esoteric stories, we were light beings. Adam and Eve were beings of light. And then they're given, they're evicted from the gateway, from Eden, sent through the gate, and then given coats of skin. And so from that perspective, the human body seems to become a, a bit of an orange prison suit in, in, in a way. It, it's certainly something to be transcended. And I believe that this sets up the, the belief system that the only way to get back through that gate is to drop the, the orange jumpsuit to, to drop the human body because it's not going through the gate. And William, this reminds me of uh, the time when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. The Vatican sent some of their highest ranking people there just to see what was coming out because the information could uh, definitely also jeopardize uh, Judeo-Christian religions. And on this show, mo most of the people who listen are always pursuing, just like me, the three most important questions. Who are we? Where do we come from? And why are we here? It seems that the powers that want to be, especially organized religion, they want to keep this information secret from us. Because if we don't know who we are or what our purpose is of being here, then we don't ask questions. Why is this knowledge so important for them that they want to keep us in the dark like mushrooms and certainly we are forbidden from knowing that we have so much more power potential and abilities than we are led to believe well part of the reason uh is you can't have a planet full of christ-like beings that are running around they're unmanageable and they don't pay taxes so that's that's part of it but ultimately if you follow the the pathway through like the work of Zechariah Sitchin, he sets up that conflict between the two factions of these of these God beings who, in his view, control the human race. You had the one faction that sought to uplift humanity to the level of the gods and even to transcend the, the, the capabilities of the gods. And then you have Enki and Enlil. Enki and Enlil, right. Then you have the other faction that want to keep us at the level of slaves and sex objects. And the, the gospel of Zechariah Sitchin says that these beings came here to mine gold. Well, I don't, I don't buy that argument. I, I dropped that a, a long time ago and uh, had to come up with a different justification for the creation of the human body. And what I noticed is that the being that is attributed to these, uh, the, the, who is credited rather with transforming or altering the human genetic code into a slave race is, is Enki. Enki is the guy that wanted to see us to, uh, to spiral up the path of ascension. Furthermore, he was also considered to be the god of alchemy, the god of smithcraft and alchemy. And as I read that, I'm thinking, okay, Zechariah Sitchin is saying this is the guy that came to earth to mine gold and violated what, you know, to use a Star Trek term, violates the prime directive, creates a slave race to, to mine this gold. Why didn't he just go grab a hunk of space rock somewhere and transmute it? Why did he have to go to all the bother to, to come here to do what, what, what ultimately happened here? And the, and the answer that I propose is that they weren't here to mine gold. In the alchemical tradition, Gold and the human soul are considered to be interchangeable. They're not really out to try to turn lead into gold. They're trying to transform an impure soul into a pure soul. So they're here to mine souls and utilizing the human body as a vehicle, a, a vehicle for which that soul can use to scale the ladder to heaven, to, to act like uh, Jack climbing the beanstalk into the higher heavenly worlds. 
The problem is, is that as you spiral up that path of ascension, your capabilities increase. Suddenly you, you can bilocate, suddenly you can teleport, suddenly you can levitate, suddenly you can instantly manifest wishes. This is very dangerous. If you've got people running around that are not fully developed souls, soul beings utilizing this kind of power, they can turn into ruthless dictators like a Hitler or somebody like that. So part of this is about keeping this knowledge out of the mainstream and, and making it so that the seekers then are the ones that are really deeply going out and gathering this information and doing the hard work of perfecting their soul. Sitchin claimed the Serpent of Eden was actually Enki, mm -hmm. the leader of the Anunnaki, mm -hmm. who was shown to be ha a half-human, half-serpent. Mm -hmm. Does this make Enki also a light being? Well, you've, you've hit it right on the head, but uh, we have to kind of walk into how we answer that question affirmatively. When you go back and you look at the earliest depictions of the, the Garden of Eden story, the serpent is actually a winged serpent. And that, of course, yes. now we're, we're talking about Enki. There's no question we're talking about Enki. We're talking about a, a winged serpent or who is an illuminated being, a shining one. So he's shining, he's winged, and he's half human, half serpent. Well, wait a minute. So are the, the seraphs. The, the seraphs in the Judeo-Christian tradition are the highest order of angels. They're called the fiery serpents, the winged or fiery serpents. They're considered to be beings of pure light and pure love. They dwell at the throne of God, and they are considered to be the highest order of beings. So if, in fact, Enki is the winged serpent, or is a winged serpent, by definition, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, he is a seraph. He is a being of light. And now this takes us into a really interesting territory here because you, you've got some folks out there that, that believe the Anunnaki are reptilian. And they use this justification, oh, Enki's the winged serpent. Well, so he must be reptilian. Well, I mean... Yeah, he's denigrated and demonized all the time. I know it. And it's like, where are you guys coming from? I think they need to just dig a little bit deeper here. And if you do that, you're, you're confronted with the question of whether or not the Anunnaki were physical beings at all. They instead, at least Enki, appears to be some kind of a, a light being, a, a spirit being that can take physical manifestation. So as I delved into that further, it's, it's a very important question because, of course, the, the fiery flying serpent is the definition of a seraph or seraphim in, in, in Judeo-Christian tradition, but that's also the definition of Quetzalcoatl, the Mayan savior right. figure, who is yep. portrayed as half human and half serpent. So are we talking about a recurrence of this same figure or what? And they expect him, of course, according to Maya 2012 enthusiasts, they believe that he's going to be coming out of the center of the galaxy riding upon a serpent rope, which my, my friend John Major Jenkins says is actually a wormhole. And this is exactly how I believe these light beings travel. They don't, they've dispensed long ago with, with flying saucers and that kind of thing if they ever used them. Instead, they're, they're traveling through these interdimensional portals, through these, these wormholes. And so as we delve into this further and further, um, we start to recognize that, okay, wait a minute, we're talking about a, a completely different order of beings here, and why did they get this rap of being reptilian? Well, the answer that I propose is that when you look at these depictions of the seraphs, uh, they have these vortex-shaped bodies in, in Judeo-Christian art. It's, and the idea I think we're supposed to get from that is that their bodies are actually spinning. They're spinning vortexes of light. And they're six-winged, which I think of as connecting with the six points of the what's called the, the Merkaba, the chariot of the spirit, the chariot of light, which is the preferred transportation vehicle of these high order of beings. So it's like a 3D star of David. A 3D star of David, that's right. So instead of showing the, the six points of the star of David, instead they show them as six winged. That's that's my take on it anyway. But they so they've got these vortex shaped bodies that are spinning. They're we're, we're told they're beings of pure light, and they uh, might be in fact in their Merkaba vehicle. Well, I matched those depictions up with some very powerful uh, depictions of from uh, the Tibetan tradition of what they call the rainbow body. 
in Tibet, there's a teaching. It's an extraterrestrial teaching, which we can talk about at source here in a minute. But the Tibetans believed that the human body, the, the frequency of the body can be accelerated. It can be spun into a vortex of energy so that ultimately it, it manifests as five-colored rainbow light, leaving behind only hair, toe, and fingernails, which have no nerves to be transmuted. And when they show the rainbow body in Tibetan art, it's a swirling vortex of rainbow-colored light. And you put that beside the Judeo-Christian's depictions of the, of, the, uh, of the seraph, and it's a virtual perfect A to B match. It seems that what we're talking about, and this was a belief uh, during the Renaissance, by the way, that humans can transform into seraph or seraphim. They can transform into beings of light. And the Tibetans absolutely believed that. And in fact, up into the modern day, they talk about manifestations of these rainbow body beings. And they refer to this process as the great perfection. The perfected human is one who has transformed themselves into pure light, pure love, and manifested it as the rainbow body. Now, the thing is, is that when you see their faces, when you see the faces of those who have achieved the rainbow body in Tibetan art, we're not talking about actual photos, we're talking about Tibetan artistic representations of this. You see their necks and you see their face, and it's really intriguing, Mel, because with this swirling energy, their necks almost look, and their, their neck and faces almost look serpentine. And I'm thinking, is this the origin of the whole reptilian idea? I mean, the modern idea of the reptilians is basically attributed to David Icke. And when you look at, David, where'd you get that idea? Well, a psychic once told me that there were reptilian beings, and I went out and I did some traveling, and a half a dozen people talked about reptilians. You put those two data points together, and David Icke says, there's reptilians all over the place, and they're controlling yep. us. Yeah, but does that, does that say they're good? No. Or bad? No. No, it just says that, that David Icke had a psychic reading and they told him that the reptilians existed and somebody else said, oh yeah, I think they do too. And all of a sudden it's a earth-shaking matrix theory. Right. And I don't know. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is that if Enki is the winged serpent, he's a seraph. He's a spirit being. He's a light being. And he may be one of these rainbow body light beings, these perfected beings, and when he comes to Earth, he has zero interest in gold. I don't know where Sitchin got that idea. I really don't. And he's interested in souls. He's interested in transforming impure souls into pure souls. And I think when you look at the backstory of this, the whole backstory, of course, is this planetary cataclysm, that these, these souls once existed on a former planet in our solar system called Tiamat that gets shattered. Oh. Half of it becomes the asteroid belt, the other half becomes Earth. Mm -hmm. There's forewarning, there's foreknowledge of the cataclysm. Some souls got off. What if all of them didn't? Wouldn't a beneficent God, wouldn't a benevolent being say, we got to go get those guys, let's go get those souls off that shattered planet. How are we going to do it? Well, we're going to go there and we're going to create a stairway to heaven. It's called the human body. We're going to alter it, and we're going to show people how to utilize the body to transform it, to recognize that it, that they can acquire this knowledge and acquire a pure heart. They can actually spin that body into a vortex of energy, and then you know what? Then they travel to any of the other 13 star systems where this teaching is taught. That's what the Tibetans teach, is that the rainbow body teaching did not come from Earth. It was brought here from another star system, and in fact, the rainbow body teaching is taught in 13 star systems in addition to our own. And what happened in my course of investigation is that I, would, I had been talking all about the ancient Egyptian gods and how they believed we could turn ourselves into stars. Exact same idea. The, the pharaohs, their whole setup, their lives were geared towards transforming themselves into light beings or star beings so that then they could travel on the ship of eternity as star beings for eternity. And the ship of eternity, again, I propose, is the same as the wormhole. So I'm at a UFO conference uh, about five years ago. It was, happened to be the Bay Area Expo. A couple comes up to me and says, hey, we, we love your work. Uh, we watched Star Walkers and the Dimension of the Blessed. And you answered for us a question that 
we've been looking for answers to for a while. They then told me that they both had PhDs from the Harvard Divinity School. They knew the Dalai Lama, lived in India, translated Tibetan texts about the rainbow body, and and were the ones that told me, and I later saw it in other texts as well, that the rainbow body teaching is, is, is taught in 13 star systems in addition to our own. And after these lamas achieve the rainbow body, they can then travel to these star systems. But they always wondered, how did they get from Seoul 